I'm Alyssa. I'm Hannah. And today we're going to be talking about biofeedback, which is um, one type of mind-body strategy. So first, I wanted to go over a few definitions of biofeedback. They're similar, but they kind of encompass different aspects of it. So the first one um, is biofeedback is a mind-body technique in which individuals learn how to modify their physiology for the purpose of improving physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Um, and the other one that I picked was biofeedback is a self-regulation technique through which patients learn to voluntarily control um, what were once thought to be involuntary body processes. So like, if we're thinking about like the autonomic system, we all thought that was automatic. Um, but now biofeedback we're finding that that actually can be regulated by the self. Um, so here's a photo of kind of what biofeedback can look like. You can see he has electrodes on his um, head and it's transmitting to the screen. We can go over that a little bit more later. But basically specialized equipment is used to convert the physiologic signs such as the heart rate, the respiratory rate, um, skin conductance, and then the heart rate variability, which we already talked about a little bit. Um, into visual and auditory cues, and then they can be um, they can be trained um, as biofeedback. You'd have like a biofeedback practitioner kind of train the person how to respond to these cues. And a cool analogy that I found, and it was used multiple times, was kind of when you look into a mirror, you're getting this um, immediate like response of like what you look like, and then you can alter like your hair if you don't like how your hair looks, and you can kind of make changes. The same way with biofeedback, it's kind of like a mirror into what's going on inside your body. You're able to see these autonomic cues, and then you're actually able to respond and alter that and train yourself in that. So here's our history. Um, so Neil Miller is considered the founding father of biofeedback. Um, his research on this kind of um, peaked at 1961. This came about when he challenged the thought process, um, challenged the thought that changes in the physiologic function could only occur through classical conditioning um, as a result of involuntary or reflexive processes. But through a series of animal models, he was one of the first people to use um, rat models, especially with um, EEGs. So um, he demonstrated that operant conditioning of multiple autonomic functions could be achieved. Alyssa will get into the classical versus operant in a little bit. Um, but he's actually from Yale. He was one of the directors of a laboratory in Yale, so I don't know if you guys like Gilmore Girls, but it's fall, and then she went to Yale, so that's fun. And then that's a picture of him. And then I also thought this was really interesting. This kind of shows just how controversial he was during his time, but how widely accepted um, biofeedback is now. So um, this is from like the um, encyclopedia, but basically, um, in 1961, he first suggested that the autonomic nervous system could be as susceptible to training as the voluntary nervous system. That people might learn to control their heart rate and bowel contractions just as they learned to walk or play tennis. His audiences were aghast. He was a respected researcher, director of laboratory at Yale, but, he, but this was a kind of scientific heresy. Everyone knew that the autonomic nervous system was precisely that, autonomic or beyond control. So that just shows how, you know, against the norm he was during that time. Um, so here's just kind of a simple diagram of how it works. Kind of going into, you know, researching all of this, I was pretty confused about like exactly what's going on. There's multiple places that you can put the sensors. Um, we'll go into like all the different types in a little bit. But here's just a common example of um, what would be a subclassification of neurofeedback, where you have the electrodes on the head, they're transmitted from these are the sensors, they're transmitted um, to the transducer. So you can see like the EEG you would see here. And then a lot of times this is actually transmitted, especially for children, into kind of like a game. So that you can kind of like, oh, cross the river or dodge this, this kind of thing. So it makes it a game. And kids and adults are actually able to like change um, their physiologic processes to win the game, and that's kind of a training mechanism. So it's super complex, but that's kind of a, that's kind of the loop that goes on. So then kind of like the learning model of biofeedback, we have to thank <coughs> our the psychologists for kind of um, helping create the theory and the processes of how like it actually works to create change. So as Hannah mentioned, it's um, based off of the principle of operant conditioning and feedback learning. So basic, so operant conditioning is basically the learning theory of how people and animals develop responses through repetition of reinforcement, whether that be a positive reinforcer or a negative reinforcer. 
So in the case of biofeedback, the behavior that we're trying to change, that we're observing, is the physiological response, whether that be your heart rate, your skin temperature, your respiratory rate. And then the positive and negative reinforcers translate to the um, visual or audio displays. So like for example, if we want, if you're anxious and your heart rate goes up, they'll put um, a visual display to notify you your heart rate's up. And then that will kind of like reinforce the behavior for you to um, make the change. And this is how you basically prompt the patient, patient to change their physiology. So we um, found a research paper that basically kind of like summarizes it in a, in a diagram is that you use these um, operant learning techniques, which is gonna create um, an awareness in the patient to then cause the physiological change and then the reduction in the um, behavior that we're observing. In this case, they used anxiety as an example. So we um, had a little question, we, um, which of these is not a type of biofeedback? There's EMG training, EEG training, temperature training, hemo, hemoencephalography training, heart rate, skin conductance, and respiration training. Well, what the heck is for? Hemoencephalography. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it's a blood flow? In the, in the brain. It's a type of neurofeedback um, training. Oh, neurofeedback. Okay. Seven, respiration training. Oh, respiration training. Might be. I think nine, all of these are. Okay. 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 So actually, all of these oh, have, yeah, have yeah. been found to be evidence-based forms wow. of um, doing yeah. biofeedback. Yeah. EMG is. EMG is. We use it in physical therapy. I didn't know EEG is, though. So wait, with EMG, yeah. you're measuring muscle tonicity. And, oh, and you, you can use that to help the patient improve that? Yeah, so uh, wow. externally, we use it for like uh, recruitment of the vastus medialis after you know, knee surgery, for example. Mm -hmm. So the patient, because those muscles sort of shut down after surgery. And then pelvic floor rehabilitation, we use it to internally, either vaginally or rectally, right. to help people up train or down train uh, the pelvic floor muscles. Has anybody done neurology? Have you ordered EMGs? I was on an EMG. Service so it's a passive thing. It's like we're just yeah. seeing if your muscles are awake, alert, responsive. Mm -hmm. So here's an application where you can use it as a therapeutic intervention. That's very really interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, good quiz, you guys. Very yeah. training. Yeah. And I have seen an example of the respiration training later on. It's actually the only FDA approved um, mm -hmm. biofeedback. It's the only FDA approved. What I could find, I believe so. At least that device okay. is what it looks yeah. like. So there could be more. I wouldn't be surprised, but that's what I was able to find. Um, so here's some of the types. These are the more traditional types. So the electromyogram, which we were just talking about, measures the muscle tension activity. So it's typically used for back pain, headache, anxiety disorders, muscle retraining after injury, and incontinence, as well as like the pelvic floor also kind of makes sense with the incontinence as well. Um, and then here's like an example of kind of the game. You can see a little bit like this kid's playing a game with the rainbows. Like, it makes it so fun and like it's so cool how the kids can kind of self-correct so quickly. Um, and then third row biofeedback. So this measures skin temperature, typically used for headache, a rain outs phenomenon, and anxiety disorders. Um, and then the EEG measures brain waves. This is specifically called neurofeedback. And then it's used for ADHD, epilepsy, and other seizure disorders. And then the electrodermal measures sweat production, typically used for pain and anxiety. And then the heart rate variability, so you can see that one over there. You can see how between the different beats, there is a different distance between the beats, um, measures the pulse and variations that occur between beats, typically used for anxiety, asthma, COPD, and then a regular heartbeat. And then, okay, so here, um, this is the biofeedback device. Um, well, we have a video on kind of how you can see it being used in real life. It's really interesting. So um, basically, you've got some interactive computer and mobile device programs. You can kind of see those on the previous slides with the computer acting as the transducer. Um, but then we also have more of the wearable devices. So uh, this one here is called Respirate. So um, basically, a sensor is worn on the body, and it's able to um, you know, basically like detect different changes in the patient and then alert the patient and help them alter their behavior. Um, the big thing with all of these is it requires a lot of practice and it's the kind of thing that we get better with with time, kind of like mindfulness or meditation. 
So for this, for the respirator, so it's FDA approved, it's been clinically prone, um, proven to lower blood pressure by using a wearable belt with a sensor to assess the breathing pattern. So the device will play tones to guide slower breathing tones in, in and out. Um, it's re requested to use this like, I think three to four times a week. So not that much, and it's just for about like 10, 15 minutes. And it's actually been shown to activate the parasympathetic response, which consequently dilates the blood vessels through this deep breathing exercise. And it's been shown to lower the blood pressure by 14 millimeters of mercury systolic over 18 diastolic, which was very comparable to um, some studies on 10 milligrams of amlodipine causing a decrease in 13 um, millimeters of mercury systolic over 8 diastolic. Um, also, so Medicare does not yet cover this, unfortunately, but it's available um, on Amazon for $280. Um, some insurances, I think, do cover this, um, but it's still kind of in the works. But you don't need a prescription to buy it. You can purchase it, you know, on something simple like Amazon. And I kind of did like the cost analysis. But like, for example, one month of you know a first line antihypertensive like amlodipine is nine dollars twenty nine cents. So after two and a half years, that will equate to for a similar reduction in blood pressure, um, what you would see, um, how much you would be end up paying for amlodipine anyway. Yeah. When it says uh, three to four weeks of regular use, is that like 24 7? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. So, um, three to four weeks of regular use is doing those three to four sessions per week. Each session oh, is like okay. 10 to 15 minutes, if I remember it correctly. So, pretty minimal, honestly. That's so, a few minutes. sessions per week, and then you're seeing that um, reduction shown here after like three to four weeks, is what I understood. So, um, this is a I thank you for including this. This is one of my favorite little devices. This was created, I mentioned this once before, by a Rush cardiologist from Chicago who was just sick and tired of adding more and more medications to his patients with hypertension. I can't remember his background in knowing <clears throat> that you could use the breath to also affect blood pressure, but he devised this also initially was shunned. You see the theme here. <laughs> this looked down very suspiciously. And I have plenty of patients who are using this and it's effective. Awesome. Well, it seems yeah. amazing. It seems yeah. very, it's awesome. very yeah. easy. I'm amazed the cost is so reasonable. Yeah. You know, it's only 280. Yeah. It's great. When you think about it, like they'll be on, you know, all patients are on that for the rest of their life, you know, and then yeah. adding stuff. Alyssa and was a little cheaper. Like to think about just two and a half years on it, you know, mm -hmm. kind of pays off to avoid like, some side effects, you know. Mm -hmm. so. And then one day we'll have the question, we'll have the conversation about why Medicare doesn't cover it when it's been shown to be effective mm -hmm. through scientific mm -hmm. study. Yeah, that's good. Okay, mm -hmm. so we do have a link um, to see kind of how it works, just to kind of show what those like wearable devices. And there's so many devices out there, but this is like the main FDA approved one that kept coming up. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I need oh, sorry. It's my yeah. Did you know that half of America is available without a prescription? A breathing sensor and earbuds. The sensor, placed on the upper abdomen, analyzes your breathing pattern. Then the device's onboard computer creates a personalized program consisting of two tones. Breathe in. Breathe out. So yeah, so I was super excited about that. That was, you 
know, a really cool example. There might be someone out there, there's a lot of more feedback devices out there. Um, this is like the main FDA approved one that has the most like, research behind it. Then we have like another question. It's based on meta-analyses of current scientific biofeedback studies, for which of the following diagnosis is biofeedback rated as an efficacious treatment of choice? Yes. Oh. <laughs> so yes, all of them, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about these. So now we're gonna just talk about a little bit more about like patient considerations. Who would you consider referring? And why would you consider referring these patients? So there's multiple diagnoses that kind of have been shown to be efficacious. I found um, a paper that kind of created a, t a table and this um, kind of like level system where they were like level five is efficacious down to level one or level two, which was possibly, this was in 2010. So many of these diagnoses have moved um, over as more studies have been done, but specifically for like constipation, urinary incontinence, chronic pain, including um, fibromyalgia, low back pain, um, migraine headaches, tension headaches, irritable bowel uh, syndrome, anxiety, and hypertension are just some of the diagnoses that have been um, proven to be an, uh, efficaciously treated by biofeedback. And then like, who would you um, consider referring? There's no really contraindication to any kind of the forms of biofeedback, so it would be safe for children up to the geriatric population. Um, and is very well tolerated. Um, just some things that it might not be the best form for everyone because you have to be able to play um, an active role in the treatment. You have to be able um, to follow commands, um, keep attention. And then you also have to be someone who's like willing to play an active role in, ki in kind of your um, treatment journey because studies have shown that if you only practice the technique within like the therapy, um, environment, you're not going to get the benefits if you don't practice what you've learned at home. So the person has to be motivated and kind of um, be ready to make the commitment to kind of take the techniques they learn um, in the biofeedback session home and practice that um, regularly. <coughs> and then two, understanding what um, modality would be best. So like for example, for migraines or tension, you can do um, heart rate or you can do blood flow. So kind of um, talking with your um, brain blood flow, talking with your patient to see which is the one that will um, really help them um, respond better. And then these, um, we decided to talk, look at some benefits that are both mind, body, body, mind. So also to consider if you have a patient, kind of if you feel like they would um, um, sow some benefits from this, is um, in, the, in the mind aspect, you know, they're gonna learn techniques to become skilled at self-regulation, self-relaxation. They're gonna be able to adjust to pain better as they become more self-aware. They might become more resilient to stress and the effects and also maybe improve their mood and stability depending on how their diagnosis um, have, has affected their daily life. And then in the body side, as Hannah mentioned, they're gonna, you're gonna be able to um, regulate your parasympathetic nervous system better, um, modulate stress, and really um, modulate pain as well. So then we, um, Kind of decided to just find a, a few examples in the literature because there's a lot of diagnoses um, that are efficacious. So this is kind of just like a little a glimpse of what there is. So migraine is one of the ones that has moved into kind of like the level five level of efficacious for biofeedback. And we found um, this meta-analysis that they found a medium effect size for both short and long-term outcome. So this is something that are helping migraine patients long-term as well. It's just not acutely within their session. They found that it significantly reduced pain and psychological sy symptoms with the scope of 11 sessions. So now, now a lot of the research is kind of going into how many sessions do we need to do in order to um, reap the benefits. And if you think about migraine, 11 sessions is very minute considering that a lot of patients need to do like the step ladder of therapy. It's very debilitating and a lot of the migraine medications have a lot of side effects. So they uh, meta analysis said that it could be recommended as an evidence-based behavioral treatment, although as uh, Dr. K had mentioned, it's still not kind of like in the guidelines of referral yet, but has been proven to be very efficacious. 
And then Hannah, we mentioned the hypertension device, and so we also found a meta-analysis on hypertension. So they had three groups, the biofeedback group, and they compared them to the active control group, with, which had cognitive behavioral therapy and relaxation therapy, and then the inactive control group basically was just placed on a waiting list and was measuring their blood pressure at home. And what they found was both biofeedback and active control groups had a reduction in systolic and diastolic pressure, but only the biofeedback group showed a significant reduction when compared to the inactive control treatments. And then we kind of wanted to show an example of this. So we've shown how like um, psychologists have really helped this practice and another big ally are physical therapists. So it's been shown to help with pelvic floor and even urinary um, incontinence in women. And it's also shown that women with urinary incontinence have um, been able to see an improvement or at least a cure in that symptom, which can be very debilitating for a lot of people. And when it comes to treatment options, those are a little bit more limited and people kind of have to learn to um, work around it. And then the last one we have is kind of like future, kind of looking at future directions of the possibilities. So we found a study that basically how HRV can reduce food cravings in high food cravers. So kind of very important for people with eating disorders or maybe just people that are having it, um, trouble losing weight. With weight gain, now they're um, even looking how we can use biofeedback to be an acting therapy to nutrition. And they found that they've had some subjective reduction in food cravings. So this one's not um, evidence-based yet, but there's lots of different areas now that they're looking um, to explore biofeedback as to how we can use it to further treatment for patients. And then Han and I both like this quote, just to wrap everything up, that says, the greatest revolution of our time is the knowledge that human beings, by changing the inner attitudes of their minds, can transform the outer aspect of their lives. Why do you think that is? Why do you think you can reduce food cravings through biofeedback? What do you think is happening there? I feel like the heart rate availability is kind of like the autonomic nervous system. And if we're in like a fight or flight high cortisol state, doesn't that kind of cause cravings? So maybe there's like an inverse relationship. That would never thought of it. like an inverse relationship there. Right, right. When you've got high cortisol, you're not going to crave the sick. You're going to crave, really crave, carby, sugar.